Welcome to the second episode of The Serial Swindler. I'm Tiffany Ang. If you haven't caught up with our last episode, you might want to go back. In this episode, we'll try to piece together clues that will help us understand what goes on inside the mind of a serial scammer like Gerald Lowe. Who is he? What motivated him to go on a cruel spree where his victims lost almost $100,000? But before all that, we need to get back to the police who were on his tail after receiving multiple reports. Except they too were caught in another web Gerald has spun. The first report of telco scam was lodged in June 2018. Within the next two months, there came in additional reports. And that's where we know that this is not just a standalone. Gerald Lloyd is actually committing a lot of series of offences and then we need to get him fast. That's ASP Ho Che Him, the investigating officer for Gerald's case. But his plan to get Gerald fast took an unexpected turn. In September 2020, we secured the conviction to have Gerald prosecuted in court but Gerald comes in to lodge a police report. He said that he has been physically and verbally assaulted, threatened by his partner. And whatever criminal activities he has done, he has been coerced to do that. Did we really charge the wrong person? The sole suspect of the police investigation now claimed he was the victim of a crime. This meant that ASP Ho and his team had to trawl through the evidence again for the next nine months, they re-interviewed Gerald and several witnesses. We re the evidence again. Re-reading of the data, matching each and every of their versions. Then we line it up and then we discover, hey, that doesn't sound right. Eh? Gerald haven't even met his partner. How come he said that in 2018 he started to do this? So it's the timeline that gave him out. Eventually, it became clear that Gerald was trying to fool the police. More than nine months of police work, re-interviewing has been put into place because of the false reports and the statements that he had been giving us. So due to his prejudice to the cause of justice, the police have charged him for the additional offence for giving false statements. So we come back to the same question. Who is this guy? And why does he keep lying at every turn? My name is Gino. I've been in practice for about 11 years. Gino Hardio Singh is a criminal lawyer at Abbott's Chambers. He was assigned to provide pro bono legal services for Gerald. This was one of a batch of uh, several cases that we took from the Criminal Legal Aid Scheme, Law Society's pro bono services. I'm not particularly fussy about what is assigned, so I let them decide and I'll just take whatever they assign me. The case was challenging from the beginning, says Gino. This is probably by far one of the most complicated cases that we've dealt with. As the matter progressed, more complaints were made, further investigations were triggered. The offences he committed triggered investigations by five police land divisions. There are seven land divisions in Singapore and he basically activated five. Eventually, Gerald had 51 charges against him. These included issuing bounce checks and deceiving several people to sign mobile contracts for him. Why did Gerald go to such lengths to gain, quite honestly, not a lot of money? I found it bizarre. I asked him, why did you do this? So he says at the end of the day, I didn't think about the consequences about getting caught. I just wanted to feel good about myself and I wanted people to treat me well and with respect. As his lawyer, Gino had to build a compelling defence for Gerald. So, he spent hours trying to understand his client better. He doesn't strike me as particularly, uh, what's the word to use now? Scheming. Um, I understand that he and his mum were in debt and he would use the money to pay for his own bills. And that's what he told us. Despite knowing that his game was up and he had to face the consequences, Gerald would find ways to frustrate the legal process, like forging a medical certificate to avoid showing up in court. 
The police had tried to verify it and found that it wasn't authentic. The impression is that he had a medical certificate forged so that he could actually delay his sentencing. But the reason why he did that was because his grandmother was uh, gravely ill. And uh, in fact, she passed away not soon after that. We're not condoning it, but we could understand where he was coming from. I think eventually he understood that he had run out of excuses already and it was time to face the music. Okay, so is everyone comfortable? I'm catching up with my colleagues, Clarice Goh and Tang Hui Huan. They spent almost half a year following Gerald's case for a CNA documentary, catching Singapore's very own Tinder swindler. Clarice and Hui Huan recorded most of the interviews you are hearing in this podcast. Both of them had to comb through pages of documents and pictures, which the police and the Attorney General Chambers shared. One set of pictures of Gerald's living room stood out for Clarice and Hui Huan, and it's right in front of me. What are we looking at here? It was literally like piles and piles of things. Like you could not see the floor. This is Clarice. It was like take-out boxes, used tissue papers, um, just wires tangled up. You could see like the take-out boxes and then the tissue papers, you could see like the food bits still on them. And then the police officer, she pointed out where Gerald slept and it was like in the midst of all this. It was just difficult for me to sort of wrap my head around. Maybe this was something that he wanted to get away from. You know, every day when he comes back home, this is what he has to deal with. And so maybe this was his double life, when a time where he could just be someone other than himself. Clarice told me that after speaking to some of Gerald's victims, his lawyer and the investigating officers, she felt that one piece of the puzzle was still missing. Gerald's very own version of the story. And surprisingly, after reaching out to him in prison, Gerald agreed to speak to her and Hui Huan. So what was it like on the day itself when you got into prison? Can you take me through it? You have to surrender your phones, you have to surrender any communicative devices, even the cards and these have to be checked through by prisons. So to make sure if we go in with four cards, we have to come up with four cards. So we did all that and we were ushered into this kind of pretty nice classroom actually. So how would you describe your first impression of Gerald? Was he how you imagined him to be? When he came in, he looked so small. And then he sort of like shuffled in with his like slippers and all that. He just looked like a Celtic, you know, a small boy. So when he turned up, I had my guard up already because I just felt that he knew he was coming in here to tell his side um, and he probably has done some preparation. My childhood was horrible. My parents are divorced. My mum brought me up with my grandmother. That was Gerald speaking to Clarice and Hui Huan from Changi Prison. Almost immediately, Clarice said she noticed that Gerald speaks with a slight lisp which you might have caught too. Another thing she noticed was that he never broke eye contact. Gerald started by talking about his childhood. I go to school, friends have been laughing at me, no father, every time parents day, only mum or grandma will come. I have been looked down since young. I get bullied very easily in school. And even some things that happen, I couldn't get a voice out. Just kick everything back away and go explode. In secondary school, he claimed that things became worse. In secondary school, because of my friend bully me, I spiked Panadol into, into my friend's drink, 13 tablets of Panadol. I was arrested by Kangling Police Division. I told the judge I'm willing to change. I was granted. 32 months probation. That means I get to reunite with my family. But Gerald didn't keep to his promise to stay crime-free. Nine years later, in 2018, he began plotting again. But this time too, he justified his compulsion to seek out more victims. 
that time I'm facing hospital gap of my grandmother. She's very, very sick. I'm the sole person taking care. My mom's salary is not enough and she is also not feeling well at a point of time. She was diagnosed with cancer. I've changed multiple jobs. I'm really stressed out at the point of time. I have no one to speak to. I don't have much friends. So I Google search how to be rich in very fast time. One of the website has a particular techniques of teaching you how to scam, how to trick your friends. This only works with your close friends and relatives. During the interview in prison, Clarice brought up Sarah's story. She's the love scam victim from our previous episode. Clarice asked why did he propose marriage? And surprisingly, Gerald became defensive. Oh, okay. I want to explain about this. I did not propose to her. She told me that she wanted to find a husband to marry in Singapore so that she can get a citizenship. She was only holding a PR at her of time. And that I also never think so much. Said, okay, I, I help you. That is the intention. Uh. But after reading some of the articles online, and I find that it's actually a risky point and it, it's actually a criminal offence. So, end of the day, uh, I cancel it off. Uh. Gerald stressed that he had always intended to pay his victims back their money. And now, while in prison, he said he has had time to think about his next step. This journey, I learned a lot and I want to change. This time around, if I'm being released, never, never step back into prison anymore. I will stay crime free. I'm curious, Clarice and Hui Huan, did both of you believe his side of the story? I felt that there was probably some truth, but there were a lot of plausible truths as well. I noticed that he made pretty good eye contact. Like, he was always looking at you. It almost felt conscious because it was like, here is my story and I want you to believe in it. I have interviewed other people who are kind of on the wrong side of the law. And generally, um, they are mistrustful. They don't want to share too much. But here was someone who was seemed to be very eager to share Clarice, did you feel the same way that Hui Huan did as well? Did you feel that he was very intentional in trying to convince you his story? I felt that eye contact was sincerity in in a way. Um, and this was against, you know, what I thought I would feel, you know, because again, by that time, I really spoken to most of the victims and people who knew him, right? So I was very aware of, like, you know, the hurt that he, he caused. So I did not expect myself to feel that way when I spoke to him, you know, that I felt almost sympathetic. My conversation with Clarice and Hui Huan got me thinking, how can two people who sat in the same room with a convicted con artist leave with two different impressions of his story? Why did he agree to be interviewed in prison? Was he truly sorry to his victims? And the big nagging question, what goes on? inside the mind of a serial swindler. We often hear warnings of how we can avoid being a scam victim. But while making this podcast, I kept asking myself, what is it like being on the other side? What goes on inside the minds of these scammers? And something one of his victims said stuck with me. Chris had called Gerald a narcissistic sociopath. Are narcissistic sociopaths so self-absorbed that they have no empathy for their victims? And can Gerald really be given that label? I thought the right person to ask besides the con artist himself, is someone who has spent years studying criminal minds. So, I went in search of an expert, and that's how I found myself writing to Dr. Majid Kadir. But, I'll be honest, I wasn't holding my breath that he'll say yes. He is, after all, the chief psychologist at the Home Affairs Ministry, 
and has worked with the ministry for 31 years. Throughout my journalism career, I've experienced my fair share of cold shoulders and no thank you replies. So, as I hit sent on the email, I braced myself for the bureaucratic red tape ahead. So it was a complete and happy surprise when Dr. Majid wrote back to say that he'll be happy to help. Within days, I secured the approval from the ministry. And that's how I found myself sitting across from this veteran criminal profiler asking a barrage of questions. Dr. Majid, uh, what do you think are the main motivations of people who scam other people? Often, for a lot of these swindlers, the, the big one is money, right? So it's greed, money, but the, the other ones would be fame, you know? Mm. Uh, people know about you, people talk about you, oh, this rich person, very humble looking person, but very rich. Um, so that's a bit of that reputation and kind of branding beyond just money. At another level, it would be the thrill of it. Mm. It's very shocking, you know, to to, wow, to be able to do this and get away and no one knows, you know. People talk about me. Um, and at the science level, there's this idea called the duping delight. Okay. That's the delight of duping someone, tricking someone. Oh. <laughs> so inside them, there's this delight that, oh my God, I got away with this. You know, how dumb can you be? You know, that kind mm. of uh, thing, you see. You remember that very famous movie, uh, it's called Catch Me If You Can. So that title is interesting, right? His autobiography is called Catch Me If You Can. That's duping delight. Mm. That's like, you know, I taunt you, try and catch me. I'm a shapeshifter. But what are sort of common personality traits that we see in swindlers? If you narrow it down to certain uh, personality qualities, right, then this sensation-seeking, this this trying things out, seeing whether it works. A good comment needs to be conscientious, detailed focus, and also a very adaptable kind of person. Extremely resourceful. If you're stuck with one situation, what's the plan for the next? So you don't only have a plan A, you have a B, C, D. So almost like a highly intelligent being. Yes, yeah. They possibly could have a very high IQ as well. That's right. One of Gerald's victims called Gerald a narcissistic mm. sociopath mm. and that, you know, he has no empathy for his victims. Mm. I would think parts of it are accurate. In order to swindle someone, even if it's not to a person but to an organisation, to sign up to different phone companies and then run away and sell the phones and all that, you may not be harming a person but you're harming an organisation. Some people feel guilty doing that. So to not feel guilty at all, not just harming a person, but harming an organization and sort of getting away with it and living a lie means that you may not have that empathy. Mm. You may not feel for the broader society or individuals. Some psychopaths have these, this quality of superficial charm. So many of these swindlers have some of the characteristics of psychopathy. I have to go back to a bit of one-on-one for myself. Mm. So what is the difference between psychopath and sociopath? Psychopathy actually has stronger scientific background. A sociopath is a term that used a little bit more casually, not as much research on it. A lot of people use the term sociopath. So I, I, I wouldn't be so keen to use the term. I would say there's a lot more evidence for psychopathy. But having said that, not all psychopaths are also tricksters. Yeah. You know, uh, some of them are. You may have that tendency, but it doesn't mean you act out on these That's tendencies, right? That's right? right, yeah. But let me tell you what the characteristics of psychopaths are. They are glib liars. They have no guilt telling multiple lies. They have charm. A lot of them are charming and superficially charming. So by that, what you mean is you get taken in. You, you're so taken in by uh, their approach. They may not necessarily be good-looking people, but they have this thing with, with people. They can connect, they know which buttons to press and somehow make you feel comfortable, relaxed, right? And they, they do not have empathy. Even those who are working with scam centers across the world. If you look at the videos of them in action, many of them are laughing. So is childhood trauma or adverse events in the family often associated with higher risk of crimes in serial scammers? 
Simple answer is actually there is evidence scientifically that shows that certain very difficult childhood experiences can result in trauma in a person's life and has been correlated with criminal behaviour, deviant behaviours. But not everybody who has had a difficult childhood actually turns out that way. Many, many don't. And the many who don't have difficult childhoods do turn out to have criminality later. So I wouldn't put too much of a focus on it. But I wouldn't ignore it either you mm. know, and, mm. and say that it doesn't play a factor. I would say we'll have to be a little bit careful about those who come out too quickly to say all this happened to me and I'm like this because of my childhood. Because there are so many people who have had difficult childhoods who actually come out stronger. A difficult childhood can actually make you bitter or better, right? So it doesn't always make you bitter and yeah. a criminal. So is there a likelihood of serial scammers re-offending after coming out of prison? I think so. For a couple of reasons. In the past, if you had to con someone, you would have to gather people to your cart and you have to sell that snake oil and convince people. But today, because our communities are a little bit more segregated and so it's easy to meet someone... It's easy to use cyber means to convince someone. It's easy to create an identity completely online that's completely false. And also because we are so globally connected. So you, you've you done it in Singapore, you know, if you can, you know, go elsewhere and do it, you might. You see, if you can link up with transnational networks and collaborate with other scammers, you can get it done as well. And when they go to jail, sometimes the jail sentence seems quite light. Because you take a certain amount of money and then the sentence is tied to amount of money and, and things like that. So they go in and they learn new skills. Sometimes they share uh, stories with other criminals. They come out, they become a little bit more advanced in the way they do it. I have lost everything. In February 2022, a month before he was due to appear in court, Gerald's grandmother died from pneumonia. In March, his mother watched as the judge sentenced her son to five years and seven months in jail. I think this hurts my mum a lot because my mum was at a hearing. She did not expect that I'd done so many, so many wrong things. She visited me uh, in March. April, May, June was the last visit. So four months straight, in 8th of July, I was made aware by the region side that my mum passed on. When the OC broke to me, this news that my mum will never come and visit me anymore, she has passed on, I was very, very upset. And a lot of things just blushed through my mind. I should be the one that should be suffering, not her. I should be the one getting critically ill. And coming to prison is not worth it. Working on this story, I've come to realise that humans tend to fall for the things we most desperately desire. It's almost a weakness we cannot help. It could be a luxury watch that was selling for an unbelievably cheap price, or the promise of a better job or a business opportunity. It could be as simple as a nice compliment someone gave you after a difficult day. And that's the power swindlers have over their victims. The power of knowing that they've identified these desires and vulnerabilities and they can now exert control. We may never know who the real Gerald is. Was he a victim of a traumatic childhood or a narcissistic sociopath as one of his victims described him as? Whatever it was, what's clear is that his deception left the trail of ruined lives. And this is a silent suffering that will continue. This podcast special is a companion product of the CNA documentary called Catching Singapore's Very Own Tinder Swindler, 
You can catch it online at channelnewsasia.com slash watch. This episode of The Serial Swindler is written and produced by me, Tiffany Ang. Research is done by Jacqueline Chan, social media by Joanne Chan. Sound design is done by Sai Ye Win, and Crispina Robert is the editor. If you like this series, share it. It's available on the CNA and Me Listen apps and on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts. 